Hey everyone, my name is Sasu Laukkonen. I'm a chef uh, from Helsinki in Finland. Um, now, first of all, I will be your guide today to maybe Finnish happiness or my happiness or yours. I think happiness in general. We are right now in Lauttasaari in Helsinki. I'd say maybe I drove nine minutes from the eastern side of the city center to here. And as you can hear, it's pretty nature driven right here. Well, you're going to see a lot more, but uh, I'm a chef. I have a little tiny 18 seat restaurant here in Helsinki, a restaurant called Ora, Ora restaurant. I have a longer history in cooking, of course, but uh, having been the son of a stewardess, uh, my mom has been able to take, pick me up and travel anywhere around the world pretty much. So I've been uh, sort of focusing a lot on, on my own ingredients from this country inspired, of course, by uh, chefs more wise than I. So not that I would have to use ingredients if they're flown out from somewhere and we're right here in the middle of wild herbs and greatness in Helsinki. Why not just go with that, you know? And um, well, first of all, I think for your knowledge, we're going to forage a little bit of wild herbs. I'm going to show a little bit of one of my favorite spots to forage in. So speaking of my restaurant, which is in town, but on the eastern side, I live about 10-15 minutes away, which is a suburb, and we're right in the middle now. So I live that way, the restaurant's that way, and we're right here. Now, uh, we're kind of semi-surrounded with water. We're in the woods, kind of, but uh, it's also a residential area, so it gives you a little bit of a hint about what the purity of our nature is like. So we're not the, the bad kind of people, right? Now, first of all, what I want to show you is a wild herb that's kind of at the heat moment right now. Maybe next week. Well, if we get rain this week, it might go on for another week. But what we're looking at is wild herbs that last at their very best for maybe one week to two weeks a year. Right? So it's not like we get many seasons. Our climate is quite cold. And then when the summer starts to arrive, spring hits really fast. Almost all of the wild herbs are current for one to two weeks and then they might go worse or maybe some of them might get a second heat like some of the wild roses that you could pick. They're not ready yet though. So the roses we're hoping for next week, right? But this is the heap heap moment for most of the wild herbs in Finland. We're talking about the beginning of June anyway, in any day. It might be uh, just from my odd memory, I think there's been a five week difference between years. So let's say last year it was about two weeks difference from this year, but two years ago there was a five week difference when the first wild herbs popped up. Huge difference, right? So everything depends on mama nature. This year she's on schedule, so we're kind of cool, right? Um, now, my first wild herb to show you is called garlic mustard. It's also found in other places in the world. May I please? Thank you. I need something to pick them into, right? I must, I must ask you, is this your favorite place? Do you come here often? Uh, I come here like two times a week right now. But during the winter time, I don't come here at all. So. But it, it, it depends what you need. So let's say about the wild herbs, there could be 15, 20 different varieties right now that we could pick and use. I've only selected a few for this one dish with the fish, right? Because you all know we're going to be foraging and frying fish. So, down here, with the beautiful flowers, which are also highly edible, this guy is called garlic mustard. Um, the leaves are quite soft now, which is a great thing. They can be used as is. They don't have to be cooked at all. But when warmed up, they have a very rucola, arugula-like flavor. Very sort of peppery, a little bit maybe oniony and garlicky. So hence garlic mustard, right? So I'll pick some of the leaves. Um, and some of the flowers for decoration. But I really do want the fish dish to get a little bit of the pepperiness from these guys as well. So just a couple from here. Oh yeah, there's something over there that I want to show you. Um, there's a lot I want to show you, right? But uh, the nearest guy for here is the stinging nettle. 
the nettles are the ones of course that that will burn you so you have to have gloves to pick but uh, instead of using spinach we have a lot of this from where that came from right but over there there's something that I forage from nearer to my house uh, because I have permission see all of wild herbs like this or like chickweed that's actually here just and usually in Finland you would find chickweed it's kind of a grassy almost like a, a green peas kind of a taste How many it's in it? oh I can't remember I'm going through so many languages you know with <laughs> these guys but um, I'll, I'll tell you later right Perfect. so chickweed here all of this little guy over here and going on to something very very important for us as a childhood memory um, here we have loads and loads and loads of wood sorrel so many different kinds of sorrel in the world of course they're all the same in one thing they're acidic so they have acidity which I picked a couple already right but this guy this is where we're at so our spruce trees are right now shooting shooting meaning new growth of the tree right um, the new growth is beautifully kind of balanced and acidic and very fresh and can be used in various ways we're uh, we're drying them and we're pickling them sometimes usually freezing them for later use like imagine like a salmon tartare in the winter time when the salmon are really really fatty and then you have a lot of these guys the spruce shoots in there it's just so fresh tastes like the forest everyone says so so um, but the thing is I don't have permission from the city of Helsinki to, to pick this guy here but where I live in Espo I have permission so I picked them from there right uh, going on because we need to cook as well right don't we I think so so I would go backwards a little bit because um, there's a couple of uh, how should I say um, for, for my taste quite important things that grow in the region and not in such vast amounts so and not every year is so beautiful in the amounts of let's say wild raspberries this is something that we can find over here oh yeah by the way if you have any questions in mind we can talk about that later right um, and please send them over so uh, so Julia can pick them up and and go from there so we're going to be heading towards the water actually where my cooking spot is come with me so actually we have a question sure. so we have these four seasons in Finland and you little bit mentioned that maybe there is only two seasons for ingredients so yes. what do you mean by that well living in this country and cooking in the midst of all this how, how many weeks ago it was still totally gray mm. like three four weeks the changes are so big from summer to winter and our autumn is so full of mushrooms and so full of wild berries that you can go pick in the forest and all that but the seasons are so short and if we compare the seasonality let's say four months of the year you would have all kinds of ingredients growing in mother nature and on farms which leaves eight months of absolutely nothing nothing so you would say now is the time to collect these all amazing herbs well yeah if, if you think of garlic mustard for example the garlic mustard with the beautiful flowers the next step after flowering it's going to make these little um, sort of small outcoming Can you show this things hammer? yeah sure actually these guys just underneath the flower here you see they will grow through the flower and go much much higher and then after the leaves will be very very sort of irony and super super peppery so not that usable for food I'd say of course for nutrition why not but garlic mustard will go to a phase where it's called see you next year and so let's say two weeks of season for this two weeks of season for that means you'll see them next year at the same time right now something not to pick because there's also things that you shouldn't do this guy it might look like wild garlic but it's our national flower and you wouldn't want to go there right 
not edible. Next. <laughs> so, something I want to show you from trees that you don't necessarily have to have permission for. This guy is called Pihlaya or the rowanberry tree. There's one here much, much bigger and one just behind here that's much smaller. Just before the rowanberry actually comes into leaves, that little bud is very, very, very bitter almond-like. You can make really, really green milk, for example, just blend them into milk and freeze the milk and use it, let's say, all, uh, all winter long for a really, really bitter almond-like flavor. It's amazing. It's almost like green amaretto, if you will. Now, the guy I was talking about, wood sorrel. Down here, these ones contain a very, very important and vivid childhood memory for us. These green leaves. Now, there are other kinds of sorrel in Finland as well, but this one, especially when we were kids, probably in the city outskirts, playing Robin Hood or whatever in the forest, you would be nibbling on these guys for a super green, clean, acidic taste. Um, and then there's another root. It's not found here in Lautasari actually, but uh, another root that's very close to the rocks that we used to dig. And then we were, um, it's almost like licorice or anise and very sweet. <laughs> it's called the common polypody. So Kallio Imarre in Finnish. Now, so these guys, very important for acidity and all kinds of childhood memories from the region. So would you say every Finn has collected these from an early age? I do believe that every Finn has collected these from early age. If not, something is missing from your childhood, right? <laughs> okay, cool. What I want to show you about the wild berries, the raspberries, for example, is right here. This is the first year raspberry. These little flowers over here, the little leaves, you see the flowers? They will become raspberries later on, but they will, there will only be a few this year. When it goes on to the next year, the next ones are right behind here. They are huge. They are tall and beautiful. These guys are second year raspberries. And these will come in vivid, big, big amounts, right? So. You can see a lot more flowers as well, which we come, which will become berries eventually. Now, so we don't want to stomp on them, but we're going to go through them. If there are any new viewers, could you tell where are we now? What is this beautiful place and what we're going yes. to do in a moment? Of course. So Helsinki city would be by car about nine minutes that way. We are in Lauttasaari happy island in Helsinki in Finland, right? And now there's a place I'm going to cook something at and we've been picking a couple of wild herbs and a couple more at the table. Please join me. Um, one of the funny and also medicinal plants that we've had here in the region is this one. It's called meadow sweet. As you can see, there's a little bit of it available as well. <laughs> it is also free food, quite highly important to talk about from our region is of course the purity of nature and the fact that we're not, you know, we're quite good with the environment as well in Finland, is that we have something called the every man's right, which means that we can pick these guys for food anywhere. Now remember, every man's right does not contain trees in the system, in the, the rights itself, you have to have the permission of the landowner. So this is why I said from earlier that the spruce shoots that I have, that we're going to use today, I've picked them from very, very near to my house because I have the permission from my city. Now, let's go. Sure. So, apart from wild herbs, what's in season right now? Right now? Well, um, just before leaving my restaurant to come over, uh, we got these beautiful, beautiful white turnips with green leaves. The turnips are like golf ball size. They taste like honey right now. So it's very early in the season. I mean, it's quite beautiful and all that, but it's only like 12, 13 degrees currently. So it hasn't warmed up yet that 
much for farming like big scale, but you could have miniature radishes and miniature greens and all that stuff still going and ongoing. Right now, I'd say if you would have any of the black currant bushes available, the leaves are the most awesome right now, right, right now. They're super vivid in flavor. When the black currants go into flower, then the leaves, they lose a little bit of the taste. So this would be the moment to pick them. If you want to freeze them for later, do it now, right? All right, please join me over to the table. Boop, boop, boop. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pick a little bit of meadow sweet for our dish. It's not like it's so uh, important for flavor, but this guy has, it's, it's really, really green, almost bitter almond-like and melon-like flavor that the young leaves of this guy has. So the bigger they get, uh, they will also get a little bit metallic, maybe a little bit bitter. So if you're going to use this one, use it wisely, right? But just a couple, because I do believe that uh, when we fry fish in butter, that it can, it can carry a couple of flavors as well. So here we go. Did you also have a challenge for our viewers today? I actually did. Um, we've been talking about the fact of, of going to the store to buy some freshwater fish. Um, I've chosen my pans wisely to what I'm accustomed to. These are finished cast iron pans. You can have a Teflon pan or um, a stainless steel pan. Everything is fine to go with. But, but um, if you have been able to harness and buy some freshwater fish, white meated in, in preparation, um, I can show you a trick or two what to do. But there's also another thing I have a trick for. And this is our spring cabbage, this guy. Very salad-like, crunchy and crispy and beautiful. Um, we have a little bit more than two weeks with this guy per year, which is amazing, of course. Um, so I've had a cast iron pan on number two from nine possible on an induction all of our time now. So about 10 minutes or so, just to heat up. So you can see it is heating up, right? but it's still crispy on one side. And it's been just very, very slowly releasing its sugars onto the pan. So that actually, if I squeeze it a little bit, it's so funny because it's bubbling away because of all that moisture. That's very, very slowly, slowly, slowly coming together on the pan. And because it is cast iron, I just cranked it to number five right now or number six even. So we can beautifully caramelize it with its own sugars. They're so sweet right now. And give it six weeks, it's not sweet anymore. So we have all winter time to do whatever we want. Sauerkraut or pickle or fry or grill even. So now, horseradish. Horseradish. This would be the main ingredient with mustard seeds for most of the wasabi found in the world. And it's colored green. So horseradish, right? So a bit of a punch. So what I thought is that we'll caramelize the cabbage. And the question was all of last week, you guys, the viewers, you could choose if I would do new potatoes or new cabbage or spring cabbage. So um, the choice has been made and I'm super happy because everyone loves potatoes and we love our new potatoes. It's a really big cultural thing. Never joke to Finns about new potatoes not being that good. For example, it's very, very important. <laughs> But, uh, but it's beautiful for me to be able to show you how cabbage reacts to when you treat it right. If you know what I mean? See, it's really not on high heat going. And see the caramelization? Caramelization, it's coming together really, really quickly. And there's nothing on the pan. There's no butter, there's no oil, right? So all of the caramelization that's going to happen is from the sugars from the cabbage itself just ever so gently warmed up. Number five again, five from nine on the pan. Now, these guys I picked earlier from home, actually this morning, very close to my parking space. These are spruce shoots, crunchy, beautiful, acidic spruce. Yes. And these are Scots pine shoots. I took one with the needle so you can see how it grows. Scots pine or mantu in Finnish. 
Now the fun thing is they are both uh, fir trees, right? They're basically from the same family, although this guy would be our Christmas tree and this guy would be the guy just next to it. Funny enough, I know you don't know this so I have to tell you, funny enough in the really really bad days, the old days where people couldn't afford to buy grains, there were wars and all kinds of things, this is the tree where from your own yard or in the forest you could cut down a tree in the old days and you take away the cover, the first bark, and there's a very thin layer of the bark that people used to dry and make flour and make bread from, like pine bark basically, bark bread it's called. It's also been made in Sweden and many many parts of Finland. So people have a very vivid memory from pine bark bread because it's like the driest bread ever, but it kept people alive, so it's very important culturally for us. Now I'm going to be going back and forth because I'm, I'm, aha, see what happens? Well, Caramelization. Now that you're cooking, we have some questions. So, oh, I could, oh. <laughs> so first, <laughs> what got you into cooking? Could you please tell us a little bit more about that? What happened to me was where I was age three. And I had a huge problem. I went up to my mom and I said, mom, I have a problem. And she says, well, what do you mean a problem? I said, I'm not sure if I'm going to become a, a chef or a concert pianist. And I'm already kind of playing the piano because I was, and I was trying to play the piano, but there were no piano teachers. They said, no, we can't teach a kid three years old. Come on. Like he has to be at least five. So I was playing it just for my own fun. And, um, well, you know my choice, what it was eventually. <laughs> we, had a, we had a deal with my stewardess mom. My mom was working for Finnair, so our airline. And um, I don't know. It was important for me to go through the schooling because she wasn't sure if I'm really going to become a chef or not. Of course you don't as a parent. So I, I understand. Mom, I forgive you. Don't worry. So, uh, so. I did go through the school system as in high school and matriculation exam and all of that and then I could choose what I wanted to do which evidently was going to cooking school right away. So and then it went relatively okay in cooking school so they thought that I'm gifted as well so it's, it's all right. Say that now that you're a Michelin star chef now. Well yeah <laughs> that's their decision not mine so I'm happy they decided so though but okay. What do you say about that? That's quite cool. Right? It's, it, the, the smell is almost like burnt sugar, which is amazing. So we're going to make a very summer like dish where all of that sugar now caramelized carries a kind of a burnt caramel flavor anyway. The cabbage, I want it to be very fresh. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn that pan off and just slide it over here. By the way, uh, these pans with the handle made from birch, which is our natural national tree and the knife made from birch is a fun little collaboration I did with one of the Finnish companies called Fiskars. They've, uh, that team has been awarded the first time in Finland ever with a huge, huge, huge design award, like the best team award now. So we're very, very proud of them, of course. And it was just last week. So we're like, boom, boom. Now our fish. I asked everyone, if possible, to go out and buy some freshwater fish. For today, the fishmonger for me, he chose pike perch. Is this a typical Finnish fish? Very much so, yes. Now, pike perch would be maybe, in many parts of the world, pike perch would be closest to sea bass. Although this can be from the sea or from the lakes here in Finland. Um, the salt content of lakes and seawater is really not that far apart here. We're only 0.5% salt level in our sea, so our sea is very fresh water as well. Now I'll just quickly show you what we're dealing with. Pike perch, so very white meated fish. I'm going to trim a little bit on the side of the belly side and as you can see the fishmonger has been so helpful that he's already cut out the bones so we could basically go directly on a hot pan which also comes um, to a point where maybe one of my most important things why I'm here is to teach you guys how to fry fish my way. Now, the fun part is we're going on one side 
almost only. And I know it's not very typical, but it's also something you'll remember forever probably. <laughs> so, trimming a little bit of the excess here, just to keep it really, really neat and beautiful, the fish. Transfer them over here. And I'm going to go in two, right? And that pan is still, it's keeping hot with the cabbage, right? But what I'm going to do is I'm going to crank this guy to number nine out of nine, right? We have some salt here. We have some butter here. Well, some butter, butter, right? And the horseradish. So while we are just gently, ever so gently waiting for the fish frying pan to warm up. Oh yeah, I can use this guy. To just grab, I hope you can see this, how much the, the cabbage has actually softened. It's really, really juicy and beautiful. So I'm just going to slice one little beautiful slice of the cabbage. And I'm salting it on both sides. And then it's really beautiful, right? Very salad like on this side and really, really caramelized on that side, right? So I'm going to take the horseradish. I peeled it a little bit earlier so you don't have to deal with all that happening. I'm just going to scrape some beautiful peppery horseradish on top of the cabbage. And uh, yeah, super close. The good thing about these guys, the cast iron pans, is they warm up really fast. So now going on the plate just as is. We're not making star dishes right now. We're just concentrating on good stuff, right? <laughs> now, um, I'm going to take the hot pan. It's still on number nine out of nine. And put in quite a good chunk of butter. Yes, I know, quite a good chunk of butter. Now, the thing is, you don't have to fry fish in humongous amounts of butter but there's a couple of things it really helps. First of all, what a healthy amount of butter does is it keeps or might keep the fish a little bit off the pan. But another thing is what you can see happening here is that it's browning. And this beautiful caramel from the butter attaches to the caramel of the cabbage we have, right? What other fish do people cook in Finland? Oh this. my god, everyone wants, everyone loves salmon. Salmon, 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 yes. But uh, there is a, there's a good and there's a bad thing about salmon, right? Most of our salmon in Finland is protected because it's been a little bit overfished in the waters. So now, oh yeah, 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 highly important. You see the difference how thin or thick the pieces of the fish are? Um, it's really, really important to be following. So now I'm going to down to number four on the pan. And also what you see happening is that chefs everywhere are doing this, right? And you wonder why. Why? Spreading even heat on both sides of the fish, although it's frying from one side, right? Um, helps the flavoring so much. So, yeah, but uh, talking about the salmon, right? Uh, lots of our salmon are protected in the region because it's, it's, it's a really bad story to tell. It's been so overfished in the region that wild salmon doesn't really exist that much anymore in Finland. So we're trying to protect it by all means, right? Okay. Now, first of all, butter that browned and then just fish, no salt. Why? Um, it's not very usual. I know I cook a little bit differently than the others. You may decide if you want to pre-salt the fish before the cooking process or the frying, it's fine. I, you know, I don't mind. But um, the thing for me is that 
the pre-salting, the fish is very stiff. And now with the stiffness, I'm not sure if it's my favorite thing with the fish though, that the freshwater fish, how it flakes when it's cooked perfectly is just incredibly amazing, right? And I want to keep that to every single extent if possible. So, hope you can see me going, right? We're doing here right now. Sorry? Could you explain to our new viewers what we're doing right now? Yes, of course. Hi everyone, by the way. <laughs> um, I am frying pike perch on a cast iron pan in butter only to be salted very soon. Um, I've got some spring cabbage there that's been pan fried, sort of caramelized with its own sugars, flavored with salt and horseradish. And this is Lautasaari, the happy island in Helsinki, right? We're nine minutes from the center, in the middle of meadow sweets and all kinds of wild herbs and birds chirping, right? Now, can you catch this little action over here with the camera? What's happening? You see that little twist? How the fish is twisting? We've gone enough from one side to be turned. And why, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to lose the minimum amount of moisture from the fish. So just a little bit of salt now on top, then flip. Like so. Oh my goodness, beautiful. Look at that. Now, what, I don't know, can you, can you get this close to see how the spores of the fish are completely open? Like all of those little muscle fibers, they're all open, which means it's super juicy right now. Um, the other one is a little bit thicker. Actually, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through here. Yeah, to separate the two parts. So this one can be fried. There we go. Beautiful. So then, salt on the fried side more heavily. There we are. Ooh. It's a good smell now. Yeah. Maybe something about sushi? Oh yeah. We're we're doing fish, but we're doing fish a little bit differently. So my restaurant, Aura, what we did because of, uh, of course, not to be able, which is quite evident, not to be able to actually uh, serve guests inside. We transferred our product to sushi using mostly Finnish fish, right? So seasonal ingredients from the region. And uh, we've been doing takeaway sushi now for Oh my goodness, almost two months. It's gone really, really well. And I know it's very out of the normal cycle. I would usually be using local fish and local this and local that. We're still doing local, but let's say what we're doing is almost like kind of giving sushi our touch with Finnish ingredients, with wild herbs, with whatever would go in the region. And it's really funny because so many people have said that there's such a touch between Finnish and Japanese ingredients and Finnish and Japanese cooking. And it's actually quite true. The more you start doing this together, you know, Japanese ingredients with Finnish, you'll, you'll understand. It's amazing how close they are to each other in flavor and the purity and everything. So the thick side is still on the pan, but uh, we can go forward with this part, right? Um, the most important thing about frying fish is that should I say this out loud? Chefs always say you don't have to kill it twice. So kind of respect meets the, what the French would say cuisson, how it is cooked. So, cause flavors we can add later on. We can put some of the meadow sweet leaves that bring out this beautiful bitter almond like flavor, right? They're here. We can put some of the wood sorrel that contain the acidity, but still all of the flavoring will not change the fact how the fish is cooked. So when you cook the fish to perfection, at this moment, when you press it like this, it's soft. Can you see all of those juices? So when the, because people usually at home, you would think that it's 
not cooked yet if it's very soft. And this is exactly why in restaurants it would be completely different. The fish is beautiful and soft and succulent. And so to say, in Finland we have this joke that people keep a whole salmon fillet in the oven 45 minutes longer than you should, just to be sure, just to make sure that it's cooked, <laughs> you know. So as chefs we always say, don't kill it twice, it's already, you know. So. Question. We have a question from viewers. Yes. So, what does you told us your restaurant is called Ora? Yes. So, what does that mean? The word. Aha. Good question. Very good question. Now, Ora in Finnish means the spike of a plant. Actually, remember the rowan berry tree I showed you earlier that makes uh, red berries in autumn? The rowan berry tree has a cousin, uh, a bush, rowan berry bush. Now for Finns, for all Finns, if you say ora pihlaja, they go, ah, I see. So the thorny rowanberry bush, ora pihlaja, is from where it came from. So just the single, the sort of idea of ora in Finnish meaning the spike of a plant, kind of inspired for, for that cause. Okay. This guy is super close here now. The thick one takes so long to cook, but it's also really, really good for the fact of how to see how it happened, the cooking process. Because with very thin fish, it cooks very fast and then you're not sure what to do. With the thick ones, you need to be very, 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 very sort of patient and flip it only once so it doesn't fall apart, right? Now, so, the wood sorrel, the meadow sweet from right here, then the greens from the spruce shoots. These guys, we didn't go through yet. So it's really, really important to show you well what's going on. Um, what I did with the Scots pine shoots is that I didn't serve them whole. I took all of those little niblets on there. People usually think that these are pine cones, but actually, if you strip one of these down, how close it can you get? You'll see that the middle part here in the middle of those pollen sacs is the new growth of the tree, just in the middle. But then the pollen surrounds it and then the pollen goes poof. And then this middle part from in the middle of this grows to new growth of the tree. So all of these are different. So it's kind of, it looks like a pineapple, doesn't it? Yeah. With a little thingy on top. I think we're all, all interested that did anyone do this at home? So I think this is pretty easy. To oh my God, that. I hope people do, yeah. Because if you, if you live in a region with all kinds of wild herbs and in vast amounts, oh man, I think it would be a crime not to use it for food, you know. <laughs> so How would you describe Finnish food culture? Well, we've always been kind of the... Um, we know our nature, we, we know and we understand how to respect it, but we've been a little bit timid maybe. We haven't been so sort of proud of it, you know? We kind of take things for granted. We're like, well, we have these wild herbs and we have these childhood memories. I picked them once when I was 15, you know? But come mushroom time and come berry time, everyone's in the forest going, I need to pick mushrooms. like. And they're posting on Facebook saying, oh my God, so many mushrooms today and all that. But the wild herb thing is, is something we have the most of, but it's not in such big use yet. So, but see, Finns usually act on the basis of people from other countries telling them, look at what you have, look at what you have, right? So maybe we should just do more of that. Tell Finns, look at what you have. Now, May I? Would you like to try? Yes. <laughs> if I'll just grab a little bit of fish. Perfect. And some cabbage from here. And then tell me how I did. Are you just handing in the... Yes, perfect. Okay, let's see here. There you Kay. go. And please do grab a lot of the wild herbs. Wow. It's so important for the flavor. This is really good. This guy Can is I take more? just ready. Please do, yeah. I'll just grab the plate. Yes, do, do, do. Go, go, go. Here is 
how the spores of the fish open when you fry it really well and it's juicy on the inside. Now when the fish looks like this on a pan and it's beautifully caramelized, oh my goodness, do not keep it for long. So just a couple of seconds on this side, on the plate, and remember it continues cooking even though it would go on the plate. This is amazing. Thank you so much. You're welcome. We have a question. Sure. So what should people experience in Finland? Your opinion. There's quite a lot of things in Finland that you could easily, very, very easily sort of uh, experience. But, but maybe one of the more important things would be the nature in any way, in any, any way, just to get out of the city as well is very, very important to, I mean, I always say to everyone, when you land to Helsinki on a plane, what do you see? And the answer is always the same. They say, well, there was a lot of forest and a lot of lakes. And I'm like, yes, we are the land of forest and lakes. And they go, oh, but I, I, I kept, I, the holiday was in the city. And I'm like, go out. So it's only 20 minutes to get out of town to see the beautiful nature, how it is. I mean, look around. This is a residential area in Helsinki, Lauttasaari, where people jog around, they walk their dogs and all that. So that would be one. Then maybe um, sauna importance. Sauna importance, for sure. It's, it doesn't, it's not dependent on seasonality so, or seasons. So, but yeah, I guess nature and sauna would be like my thing. And Finnish food and Finnish food made from Finnish ingredients, yes. Um, should we talk a little bit of happiness before we close? Yes. So evidently, I don't think I have to tell you that part of my happiness becomes from, or my, my happiness is kind of constructed from certain things, from motivation and inspiration, of course. But the importance of having nature so close to where I am, where I cook, right, nine minutes that way, right? It's, uh, it's a huge part of, of inspiration, motivation, and of course, my happiness. To be here in the middle, imagine if I wouldn't be working right now, I would be picking these guys right here, next to the table, in this area, to preserve for the winter. And how proud you can be then in the winter time when there's nothing growing. It's like snow until here and minus 20 degrees and everyone's stiff when they come to the restaurant and you've been picking all summer long and uh, you can have all of these local beautiful wild herbs that you've been foraging yourself to have the restaurant open during the winter time. You know? What do you say about that? Sounds perfect. <laughs> That's Finland for you. Ooh, see this guy. That's what happens. Juicy, juicy, beautiful. Awesome. I now, think people want to ask more questions. Sure. So maybe you could tell what happens after this. Well, see, what we're going to do a couple of minutes after we, we are off from the live is that I can see you guys on Instagram, on Our Finland. We're going to do a Q&A session about 10 minutes over there. So you can ask me almost anything, right? Is that okay? So, our Finland on Instagram. Right. Um, is there anything we haven't done yet? Well, maybe a somersault, but I'm not good at that. I'm better at cooking, so maybe we keep it at that. Um, there are at least 20 more wild herbs that I could show you, but in this particular area, because I know that's one thing, to, to kind of uh, realize that there are hundreds of varieties in Finland that grow, that can be used for food. So they're just the ones that we're using now are the ones that are for this dish and from this area that I prefer, right? Um, and as said, there are <laughs> many frying pans. There's many knives you can use. I just picked my favorites just to show you what is very Finnish to me, right? Cool. Awesome. Now, um, we're good, no? Thanks for following, guys. And you can tell again about the Instagram so everyone knows. For sure. Our Finland on Instagram. We'll do a Q&A live a couple of minutes from now. See you there. And do you have any greetings to anyone? Nope.
<laughs> I'm sure people have greetings to me. No, of course. Hail everyone, right? Thank you so much for following from wherever you guys are. I can't see, uh, maybe it's a good thing I can't see, <laughs> but uh, I'm super, super honored that you've been following. Thanks so much.